Today, I've got a nice limit to share with everyone. So in particular, we want to calculate the limit as n goes to infinity of sine of 1 over n squared plus sine of 2 over n squared plus sine of 3 over n squared all the way up to sine of n over n squared. But before we directly look at this limit, we actually are going to need a preparatory inequality, which will make this a little bit easier to calculate. And that inequality goes like this. So for all x bigger than 0, we know that sine of x is less than x, while it is larger than x minus x cubed over 6. So notice these types of values of x definitely will work with the values that we are plugging into sine up here. Because as n goes to infinity, all of these things are positive. 1 over n squared is positive, 2 over n squared is positive, so on and so forth. So there are several ways we could go about proving this inequality. Maybe you could notice that we've got Taylor approximations on either side. We could use something about the alternating series test and approximations given by the partial sums. But the way I want to do it is a little bit simpler. So let's first focus on this inequality right here on the right. So that's sine x is less than x. So we'll consider the following function, and that function I'll call f of x, and it will be equal to x minus sine of x. And so let's notice with this new function, it's pretty clear that our goal is to show that f of x is bigger than 0 when x is bigger than 0. Notice if f of x is bigger than 0, that implies that x is larger than sine of x. And that sets up the right-hand side of this inequality. Okay, so how can we prove this? Well, we're going to use calculus a little bit. So we'll begin by noticing that if we evaluate f at 0, we get 0 minus sine of 0, but sine of 0 is equal to 0. And then if we calculate the derivative, so let's calculate f prime of x, we see that is 1 minus cosine of x. But let's notice the largest cosine can be is 1 meaning that this f prime is always bigger than or equal to zero. So that means f of x is non-decreasing on the interval when x is bigger than zero because the derivative is never negative. Another thing we can observe is if x is bigger than zero but very, very small, we know that f prime of x is definitely bigger than zero. Because if x is bigger than zero but small, then that means cosine is a little bit less than one, meaning that we have one minus something which is a little bit less than one, which gives us something that is positive. But that means that just after we leave zero, this function will leave the value of zero. And then since it's non-decreasing, it will never achieve the value of zero again. So in other words, all of that put together tells us that f of x is bigger than zero, which means x minus sine of x is bigger than zero, which means that sine of x is less than x. So that's good. We have proved half of our goal inequality. So let's get rid of this and we'll look at the other side of our inequality. So the other side of our inequality says that sine of x is bigger than x minus x cubed over 6. We'll prove this in a similar way. So let's define a new function. I'll call it g of x in this case. And it'll be equal to sine of x minus x plus x cubed over 6. And notice that just like we had before, our goal will be to show that g of x is bigger than 0 when x is bigger than 0. So if g of x is bigger than 0, then that means that will imply that sine of x is bigger than this um, cubic polynomial. Okay, so let's see how we can do this. We'll start by noticing that g of 0 is equal to g 0, just like we had before. And then we'll look at the derivative. So let's check it out. g prime is equal to the cosine of x, 
minus one plus x squared over two. That's what we get after taking this derivative. But it's a little bit hard to get a handle on the size of this, so we'll need to go one layer further. Before we do that, however, let's observe that if we evaluate this at x equals zero, we get zero. Now, one level further, in other words, looking at the second derivative will be minus sine of x and then plus this derivative here, which is x squared over two, which will just be x. But notice from our first inequality that's already been proven, we know that this is always positive. Okay, and that's gonna be true when x is bigger than zero. So what does that tell us? So the second derivative is always positive. That means that the first derivative grows from zero. That means once we have left zero, we have this first derivative is bigger than zero when x is bigger than zero. But furthermore, taking that train all the way to the top, that tells us that our function is bigger than zero when x is bigger than zero. That's exactly what we wanted to show in order to prove the left-hand side of this inequality. Now that we've produced this inequality, we're ready to jump into our limit, which will obviously make use of this inequality. So let's, let's introduce a little bit of notation. So we'll take this thing that is the argument of our limit, and we'll set it equal to a sub n, just so that we don't have to rewrite that sum over and over and over again. Now that we've got that, let's see what our inequality tells us about our new sequence a sub n. So we've got a sub n is less than this sum where we eliminate the signs. That's because sine x is less than x, meaning sine of one over n squared is less than one over n squared, and then so on and so forth. So a sub n is less than one over n squared plus two over n squared plus three over n squared ending at n over n squared. So what can we do with that? Well, I think it's pretty clear that we probably wanna add those up. We can factor a one over n squared out and we're left with one plus two plus three all the way up to n. But that's a well-known triangular number. I won't derive the closed form for this. I think that's fairly standard and I've derived it on the channel a bunch of times before. This will leave us with n times n plus one over two times n squared. So that's good to keep in mind. Now let's look at our other side of our inequality. So we have a n is larger than everything where sine has been replaced with this cubic polynomial. So what's that gonna look like? We'll have one over n squared minus one over six times one over n squared cubed. That'll be the first term. And then we'll have two over n squared minus one over six times two over n squared cubed. And then that's going to go all the way up to n over n squared minus 1 over 6 times n over n squared cubed. So now let's start putting this together. I'm going to rearrange this finite sum so that everything which is boxed in orange is next to each other. And then also everything which I'm boxing in blue is next to each other. So those can be thought of as like the like terms of this sum. So that's going to give me 1 over n squared plus 2 over n squared plus all the way up to n over n squared. So that's what we get from everything which is boxed in this orange color. And then we'll have minus 1 over 6. I'll just take the 1 over 6 and the minus sign out of the whole thing. And then we'll have 1 cubed over n to the 6 plus 2 cubed over n to the 6 all the way up to n cubed over n to the 6. And I'll box all of that in blue. So now what can we do from here? Well, let's notice that this is exactly what we had on our first calculation. So we'll just use this same calculation again. This gives us n times n plus 1 over 2n squared. Then what do we have here? We have minus 
1 over 6n to the 6, and then the sum of the cubes. Again, there's a well-known formula for that, which we'll just use. There's actually a really nice visual proof that I found online the other day. I'll maybe put a link to it right here. So that will give us n squared times n plus 1 squared over 4. So if you notice, the sum of the first n cubes is exactly the sum of the first n natural numbers quantity squared, which is pretty interesting. So now let's see what we've got going on here. We've got a sub n is less than this sequence, and it is bigger than this sequence. Okay, so let's write that information at the top of the board, and then we'll apply the squeeze theorem. On the last board, we derived the following inequality. So our sequence a n is between these two sequences of rational functions. But sequences of rational functions have pretty simple limits. Notice here we've got a quadratic polynomial on the top. The leading term is n squared. We've got a quadratic polynomial on the bottom. The leading term is 2n squared. So that means that when we take this limit as n goes to infinity, we get the ratio of the leading terms. In other words, we will get 1 half. But then furthermore, if we take the limit of this thing as it goes to infinity, this first term goes off to 1 half, just as it did over there. And then we see here, we've got a, qu a quartic polynomial in the numerator. In other words, degree 4. And we have a degree 6 polynomial in the denominator. So that means as n goes to infinity, the denominator will dominate the numerator, meaning that the limit here is zero. So we found our sequence a sub n, which was defined, you know, like in terms of these sine functions, between two sequences, both of whose limits are equal to one half. So that means we have a fairly straightforward application of the squeeze theorem to get the limit of our goal object is also in fact equal to one half. And that's a good place to stop.